This podcast contains descriptions of violence against children and adult language and is not suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, the podcast giving voices back to victims of child abuse murder and their families. I'm your host, Lane, and this is Episode 164, Joan D'Alessandro, Part 1. On April 19, 1973, seven-year-old Joan D'Alessandro left her family's home in Hillsdale, New Jersey, to deliver her last two boxes of Girl Scout cookies. She never returned. After a massive search and an intensive investigation, police zeroed in on the family's neighbor, 27-year-old high school science teacher Joseph McGowan, who soon confessed that he had sexually abused and murdered Joan before dumping her body in Harriman State Park, just over the border in New York State. For decades, Joan's mother, Rosemarie D'Alessandro, has led a charge to change laws, both state and federal, to better protect victims' families. She has also created a nonprofit foundation focusing on child safety and programs for underprivileged youth. It is my great honor to help Rosemary tell the story of her beautiful daughter, Joan, and how her memory has inspired decades of important work. This is part one of the horrifying but incredibly inspiring story of Joan D'Alessandro. Yes, I'm still alive. This part of the episode is where I'd usually thank my newest patrons and maybe talk a little bit about what's going on in my life or with the show, but due to audience feedback, I'll address all of that at the end of the episode. Normally, I don't cover stories in which the child's murderer is someone other than a parent, guardian, or caregiver. However, Joan's mother, Rose Marie, is a powerful advocate for children and victims' families. When Rose Marie reached out to me a few months ago and told me about Joan's story, there was no way on earth I wasn't going to help her tell it. For one thing, this took place right here in northern New Jersey, where I've lived for the past 24-plus years, and I was shocked that I'd never heard Joan's story before. For another, Joan's killer was a neighbor and a schoolteacher, someone that no one in a quiet suburban town in 1973 would think posed any threat to a child whatsoever. It was a crime that shocked the community and continues to resonate even five decades later. While I won't be changing my format and will continue to focus on children murdered by their parents and caretakers, it's very important to me to help tell Joan's story, and I think you'll agree with me. I do want to include a trigger warning. This story will be very difficult to hear. It contains disturbing details, including child sexual abuse and murder. Some of my research revealed some very graphic information that I think is important to include because it paints a vivid picture of the depth of this man's depravity in stark contrast to the mild-mannered, polite personality he presented to much of the world. It underscores just how dangerous some people can be while also putting on a perfectly normal front in their everyday lives. This is a horrific, shocking story that needs to be told. At the same time, it's an inspiring story about a mother who has spent decades keeping her daughter's memory alive and making real changes to protect other children and families, and I'm honored to help her tell Joan's story. Let's get into it. Joan Angela D'Alessandro was born on September 7, 1965, to parents Frank and Rosemarie D'Alessandro. As a child, Rosemarie was a determined little girl with a curious, entrepreneurial spirit who sold greeting cards to her neighbors. Her daughter, Joan, would inherit many of her mother's traits. By the spring of 1973, Joan was a proud, spunky, kind, joyful seven-year-old with a deeply inherent sense of empathy. The pretty little girl, who had blue eyes and dark blonde hair with auburn highlights, attended second grade at St. John the Baptist Elementary in Hillsdale, New Jersey and she was a member of local Girl Scout Troop No. 281 at the Brownie level. 
Joan, her parents, her nine-year-old brother Frank Jr., and her eight-year-old sister Marie lived on Florence Street in Hillsdale, New Jersey, a quiet town with a population at the time of about 12,000 people. Joan and her sister Marie, who was also a Girl Scout, had sold cookies to almost all of the neighbors within four blocks of their home. April 19, 1973, was Holy Thursday, and because the D'Alessandro kids attended a Catholic school, they were off that day for the religious holiday. After eating their lunch, apples, and ricotta cheese, the girls headed out to deliver the cookies their neighbors had ordered. By the time they were finished, they had only one order left to deliver, and that was to the McGowans on the corner of St. Nicholas Avenue and Florence Street. After completing all of the deliveries they could, the girls returned home. Marie went to softball practice, and Joan went outside to play. At around 2.45 p.m., Joan was playing outside by herself when she saw the fancy sports car belonging to their neighbor, Joseph McGowan, pull into his driveway three houses down. Excited to complete her deliveries, Joan grabbed the two boxes of cookies and told Rosemary, Goodbye, Mommy. I'll be right back. She ran down the front steps, her ponytail bouncing. Rosemary had no reason to think her seven-year-old daughter was in any danger whatsoever from the neighbor, 27-year-old Joseph K. McGowan. For one thing, it was completely normal at the time for Girl Scouts to sell and deliver cookies door-to-door on their own, especially in quiet, family-oriented neighborhoods like the one where the D'Alessandro family lived. For another, the neighbor was the type of person no one would think could be dangerous. McGowan, who was born on March 4, 1946, stood 6 feet 4 inches tall and weighed 220 pounds. He had no prior criminal record, and he taught chemistry at Tappan Zee High School in nearby Orangeburg, New York. Before moving to Hillsdale 18 months earlier, McGowan, his mother Genevieve McGowan, and her mother had lived in nearby Creskill, New Jersey. McGowan graduated from Tenafly High School in 1963. The McGowans had another son, Joseph's younger brother, who died from a congenital condition at age four. McGowan's father died of a heart attack while Joseph was attending Montclair State College, where he was a dorm counselor, an intramural softball player and bowler, and a member of the Model UN and a popular fraternity. College friends nicknamed him The Brain. Rosemarie hadn't met Joseph McGowan, but, she later said, My children said he was very nice. Joan never returned home from her final cookie run. At first, Rosemarie didn't panic. It was common for neighborhood kids to pop in and out of each other's houses, and she assumed Joan had stopped by a friend's house. When Marie's piano teacher arrived at 4.45, however, Rosemarie was starting to worry. She called every neighbor she could think of, and none of them had seen her little girl. Frank returned home from his job as a computer systems analyst for the Computer Sciences Corporation of Paramus at about 5.50 p.m. When Rosemarie told him that Joan was missing, he called the police. The first officer to respond was Hillsdale patrolman Jim Tobin, who had been with the department just over a year when he responded to Joan's disappearance. He figured this was a typical missing person's call and that the child had just stayed out too late and failed to call home. When he pulled up in front of the D'Alessandro home, however, before he even got out of his police cruiser, Rosemarie came out of the house and climbed into his car with tears in her eyes. Tobin later said, After that, I thought, maybe this is a little darker than that initial feeling. Frank and his son Frankie drove all over the neighborhood looking for Joan. When they returned without finding any signs of Joan, Rosemarie left at 6.50 p.m. to talk to the last cookie customer, taking Frankie with her. Mother and son walked over to the McGowan house, a split-level home with beige siding and red brick at 305 St. Nicholas Avenue. Rosemarie and Frankie climbed the five steps to the front door and rang the bell. Joseph McGowan answered the door, holding a thin cigar. Rosemarie told Frankie to stay outside the door as she stepped into the foyer and asked McGowan if he had seen her daughter, who she knew had come to deliver cookies earlier. McGowan, who looked like he had just gotten out of the shower, emotionlessly denied seeing Joan that day. Rosemarie later said, As I was standing there in the foyer with him, tears were welling in my eyes, and he looked at me like he absolutely didn't have one ounce of feeling. And what he did at that moment when he saw my tears, he walked up the steps to the upper floor, and he stayed right there facing me, holding his slim cigar, and waited for me to leave. She knew at that moment that Joseph McGowan had killed her little girl. 
a detective cautioned her not to jump to conclusions. Police and volunteers began searching the area, looking for Joan. Even McGowan himself showed up for the search, which continued throughout the night. Teams of volunteers combed Hillsdale and the surrounding towns, searching through trash cans, houses, backyards, swimming pools, wooded areas, and parks. Hillsdale Police Chief Philip Verisco even returned home early from his vacation in Florida to lead the investigation. At around 9.20 p.m., a state trooper visited the D'Alessandro home with a canine officer, asking for an item of Joan's clothing for the dog to sniff. Rosemary and a priest from her parish accompanied the trooper and his dog, who immediately led them to the McGowan house on the corner, walking up to the front door and then the garage door. Police would question Joseph McGowan the following day. By Good Friday, the search had expanded to include 15 New Jersey police departments, multiple fire departments, members of the Veterans of Foreign Wars group, and hundreds of civilian volunteers. Police investigated a few suspects, including a man who had been seen driving slowly around the neighborhood on Thursday, and a man who wandered into the neighborhood on foot. The first man was looking to buy a home in the area and spoke with several neighbors about the neighborhood, while the second man had gotten lost while walking. Investigators quickly homed in on Joseph McGowan, interviewing him on both Friday and Saturday. When they asked him to tell them where he had been during the time Joan went missing, McGowan told them he was grocery shopping, but he couldn't produce his receipt or grocery bag, saying he had probably thrown them away. When asked if they were in the trash can, he said he took the garbage out. However, trash pickup wasn't until Monday. His answers were evasive or simply untrue. The inconsistencies in his stories began to add up, and investigators grew more and more concerned about Joan's fate. When the public learned the Hillsdale police were questioning a suspect, a crowd gathered around the police station, many seeking vigilante justice. In the meantime, the local media took a pronounced interest in Joan's disappearance. That weekend, reporters and photographers traipsed in and out of the D'Alessandro home, asking for detail after detail. There were so many visitors coming in and out that the light brown carpet on the front stairs turned charcoal gray from the foot traffic. Police distributed Joan's school photo, in which the little girl gave a big, charming smile, showing a mouth still mostly full of baby teeth. Joan was seven years old at the time she went missing. She stood four feet, three inches tall, and weighed a mere 63 pounds. Joan was wearing a turquoise blouse, maroon pants, and red, white, and blue sneakers. Her ponytail was held back with what we used to call a bobble, an elastic band with a little blue plastic ball attached to each end. On Saturday, Joan's father, Frank, told the media, I am willing to make any arrangements with the people who kidnapped my daughter. I'll go anywhere to meet them and do anything they say. I just want my little girl back. Rosemarie said, I plead with the people who took her either to give her back to us, let us know where we can find her, or just let her go anywhere so somebody can spot her. Chief Verisco told reporters, We have no recourse but to believe that the child was abducted. She was not one of those wandering types. After two suspicious calls, during which the caller said nothing and then hung up, police installed a wiretap on the D'Alessandro's home phone in case a kidnapper called with a ransom demand. However, they told the family not to get their hopes up. There were plenty of weirdos out there who might call just for the thrill of it. One detective said, You'd be amazed at the number of cruel nuts there are in this world. Easter Sunday marked three days since Joan disappeared. The D'Alessandros missed Easter church services that morning, waiting at home for any news about Joan. At their home, Rosemary's brother-in-law, the Reverend Joseph Benedict D'Alessandro, conducted Mass. At one in the afternoon on the same day, after failing a polygraph test and confessing to a priest, Joseph McGowan finally told police what he had done to Joan and where they would find her. He said he had lured Joan inside his house, taken her to the basement, strangled her, and slammed her head against the floor. At the time this was going on, his mother was at work, but his hearing-impaired 87-year-old grandmother was upstairs, watching TV. At around 4 p.m., he wrapped Joan's body in a couch cover and drove her across the state line into Rockland County, New York. The Bergen County Prosecutor's Office made a phone call to the police headquarters in Rockland County, saying they believed a little girl's body might be located near a rock outcropping just off Gate Hill Road in Harriman State Park. 
Palisades Interstate Parkway Police Chief James W. Donnelly sent a sergeant and six patrolmen to the scene. Early on the afternoon of Sunday, April 22, 1973, within 20 minutes of the arrival of police, the body of seven-year-old Joan D'Alessandro was found at the edge of Harriman State Park in Stony Point, New York. She was in a crevice between two boulders, lying face up, her head severely twisted to the left, her body facing down the leafy slope. She had bled from her nose, and both eyes were swollen and bruised. When Rockdale County Police Officer John Forbes saw the little girl's brutalized body, Officer Forbes, a father of four young children, had to fight not to break down before he called in the crime scene team. He was soon joined by more officers, crime scene technicians, FBI agents, reporters, photographers, and members of the public. One of the D'Alessandro neighbors, Richard Collier, was an FBI special agent who worked out of the agency's New York City field office. Agent Collier officially identified the body as Joan Angela D'Alessandro, saying, Yes, that's right. This is Joan. That's right. Dr. Frederick Zugaby, at the time the chief medical examiner for Rockland County, New York, arrived at the site around 2 p.m. The area was cordoned off by police tape. Noting how many people were milling about, Dr. Zugaby raised his voice and yelled louder than he'd ever yelled before, I want every unauthorized person out of this area now. The crime scene was badly disturbed by the dozens of unnecessary feet that had trampled around it. Joan's body, however, was undisturbed. Dr. Zugaby said that Joan's murder was one of the most brutal crimes he ever investigated. He included a chapter about Joan's case in his 2005 book, Dissecting Death, Secrets of a Medical Examiner. In that book, Dr. Zugaby wrote, Now, at any setting where a murdered body is found, negative feelings are always common among investigative professionals, including disgust and anger. But dejection and tears are out of place in such a situation. If a medical examiner, or for that matter, anyone on a law enforcement team, follows the path of sentiment, professional objectivity is compromised. Tonight in Harriman, though, the situation is different. A seven-year-old girl has been murdered, mutilated, and dumped in the woods. She could be my daughter, or your daughter, or a daughter of the police officers who go about their business tonight staring blankly ahead, avoiding each other's eyes, cursing under their breath. Few attempt to make conversation of any kind, and several wipe away tears. Dr. Zugaby determined that Joan had died very shortly after her mother last saw her. He found lividity in Joan's abdomen, but she was found on her back. This meant she had died elsewhere, was left there for more than six hours, and was then dumped in this location. The absence of rigor mortis and other evidence told him that Joan had been dead for at least 70 hours, and possibly longer. To him, it seemed she was likely murdered about an hour after leaving her house on Thursday. Investigators found at the scene a gray plastic bag from a mobile station, which contained the clothing Joan was last seen wearing, including a pair of blood-stained underwear. Before clearing the scene, the medical examiner called a priest to administer Joan's last rites. Only then did Dr. Zugaby officially pronounce little Joan dead. Dr. Zugaby performed Joan's autopsy at the medical examiner's office in nearby Pomona, New York. The injuries he found were unimaginable. This is going to be difficult to get through. Joan had suffered numerous lacerations and bruises all over her skin, especially on her head and neck area a cervical fracture of the neck, a dislocated right shoulder, abrasions on her left temple, a frontal skull fracture, facial swelling and black bruising around the eyes, both of which were swollen shut, deep bruising, deep lacerations under her chin and inside her lip, bilateral sinus fractures, three loose upper teeth, brain contusions and hemorrhaging, bruising of the lungs and liver, genital bruising, a ruptured hymen, and damage to the thyroid cartilage and the hyoid bone, indicating strangulation. Blood was found collected in two parts of her throat, which meant she had been strangled twice. Joan hadn't died immediately. She put up a fight against the huge man who attacked her. Thankfully, she was almost certainly unconscious after the initial assault, beating, and strangulation but the swelling throughout her body indicated she had been alive for at least a half hour after the first attack, during which McGowan strangled her but failed to kill her. 
Later, he returned to her body, realized she wasn't dead, and strangled her to death. Her death was ruled a homicide caused by asphyxiation and head injuries from strangulation and beating. The autopsy also mentioned that there was evidence of sexual abuse. Between 4 and 4.30 p.m. on Sunday, April 22, 1973, Chief Verisco and a parish priest visited the D'Alessandro house, sat down at the kitchen table with Rosemary and Frank, and delivered the news that their little girl had been murdered. When she learned what McGowan had done to Joan, Rosemarie cried out in grief, I want to kill him. The priest chastised her for saying such a thing, but the police chief stood up for her reaction, telling the priest to leave the grieving mother alone. It fell to Rosemarie to tell her surviving children, Frankie and Marie, who took the news with blank expressions. They were only nine and eight years old, respectively, and they just couldn't process the fact that their sister would never come home. I'll pause here for a quick sponsor break. Joseph McGowan was formally arrested the day Joan's body was found. The police impounded the McGowan home to search for evidence and conduct lab tests. They also seized several rifles from the home which were not related to the crime. When McGowan was arraigned in front of Judge James F. Madden, his bail was initially set at $50,000, but authorities received so many angry letters and phone calls of protest that, the same evening, Judge Morris Poshman revoked McGowan's bail altogether. McGowan was indicted on Tuesday, April 24, 1973, for the first-degree murder of Joan D'Alessandro. He would be held in the Bergen County Jail in Hackensack for the next year and a half. McGowan's arrest shocked co-workers and acquaintances who described him as a good, nice, smart, straight-laced, church-going man and a classroom disciplinarian. The supervisor of the science department at Tappan Zee High School described McGowan as a fine and conscientious teacher. On the day McGowan was indicted, Assistant Bergen County Prosecutor Alfred L. Gentle and Police Chief Philip Verisco held a joint press conference during which they identified the suspect as Joseph McGowan, describing the science teacher as the non-athletic type and a bit overweight. McGowan's attorney, Donald R. Conway of Hackensack, listened to the press conference through an open door, but he had no comment for the press. After the suspect's arrest, parents in Hillsdale still remained vigilant. One mother told the press, I won't let my kids out of my sight, at least for a couple of days. Many parents lived in fear for much longer than that. The neighborhood changed. Children didn't play in the streets any longer, and for Halloween that year, a large number of parents refused to let their children go out trick-or-treating. As is common in the Catholic religion, Joan's family held a wake, receiving visitors at the funeral home as their daughter lay in her small white casket. Joan should have received her first communion the following Sunday. Rosemarie later described attending her daughter's wake. Frank and I sat close to Joan's child-sized casket, which was embossed with cherub angels on a white, velvet-like material. I didn't want to wear black, so I wore a white and blue dress. I still remember that dress like it was yesterday. The New York Times reported that over 900 people attended Joan's funeral mass at St. John the Baptist Church in Hillsdale on April 26, 1973, including family members from near and far old friends, Joan's first-grade teacher, and many members of the public who had found out about Joan's death through the news. In addition to Joan's parents, Frank and Rosemarie, and her siblings, Frankie and Marie, her grandparents, all of whom lived in Yonkers, New York, also attended, paternal grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. John D'Alessandro, and maternal grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Beery. The Reverend Joseph Benedict D'Alessandro, Joan's uncle, conducted the Mass with help from two other priests and several other clerics wearing flowing white robes. The Reverend Aloysius Carney told mourners at the Mass, Life is not the end. It is the beginning. He then turned to Joan's family and told them, God will give you the grace you need, now and forever. After the ceremony, Joan's second-grade class stood outside the church as her casket was carried out. They all said goodbye to their friend as the hearse drove away followed by a funeral procession of 40 cars, which drove 11 miles through the rain to Ascension Cemetery in Airmont, New York. 
the carnations, lilies, and other spring flowers that decorated Joan's casket during the funeral were taken to place on her grave, and Rosemary brought some of them home. To this day, fifty-one years later, Rosemary still keeps some of the dried flowers in a glass globe on her dresser. Joan's headstone bears a carving of Joan as an angel holding a bouquet of daisies. The inscription on Joan's headstone reads, Our Angel, Joan Angela, September 7, 1965 to April 19, 1973. Under the surname D'Alessandro are the words, He has brought you to life with him. When school resumed after the Easter break, staff at the Tappan Zee High School, where Joseph McGowan had taught, said nothing about his arrest. There was no student assembly or any type of counseling offered. The fact that one of the high school's teachers had been arrested for such a horrific crime had to be traumatizing for those high school students, especially the ones who had unsettling interactions with him during the time he worked there. But the faculty and administration essentially acted like nothing had happened other than a quiet, private meeting during which the Board of Education officially terminated him. Similarly, as if to prove it was an era in which terrible things just weren't talked about, the Tappan Zee School never reached out to Joan's family, either. When Rosemary later tried to get in touch with them about events the family planned to hold in Joan's memory, she didn't hear back from anyone. The Girl Scouts sent the family a sympathy card, but the organization clearly distanced itself from the crime, later requesting that Rosemary not use the Girl Scouts' name on a memorial to her daughter. Even family and friends backed away from the D'Alessandros in their time of loss. Rosemary said she really felt alone after the burial when everyone left and went back to their own lives. She worked hard to keep her other children's lives as normal as possible. I made sure Marie stayed in Girl Scouts because she wanted to, even though it was painful for me even to think about Girl Scout cookies. We stayed in the same house, so the familiar things would still be there, like school and friends, and not having more changes to deal with. I tried not to be overprotective. I let them continue to go out and play, though I was always attentive to their whereabouts. They had to be children, and I didn't want to be paranoid. She did, however, share with them certain information about Joan's murder case that she thought they should know. I would tell them both what was going on, so they would hear it from me. I knew they would be hearing things, and I didn't want them to hear in a scary way. We would sit on the bedroom floor and talk about anything they had on their minds. They looked forward to that and knew they weren't being left out. Several times, Rosemary and Frank took Frankie and Marie to the cemetery to visit Joan's grave. In November of 1973, seven months after Joan's murder, Rosemary lost her father to cancer. His love for Joan in her free spirit was beautiful and pure, and Rosemary fondly remembered how he would say about Joan, E così libera, which was Italian for, She is so free. In 1974, Rosemary obtained permission from Father Finnegan, then pastor of St. John's Church in Hillsdale, to use funds donated in Joan's memory to erect a stone structure around the Our Lady of Lords statue. The structure, which Rosemary calls the Grotto, includes a statue of Our Lady of Lords, and it was officially dedicated in Joan's memory on July 12, 1975. It bears a photo of Joan on a plaque that reads, In loving memory of Joan Angela D'Alessandro, September 7, 1965, to April 19, 1973, Holy Thursday. She loved life. Now she lives forever. Her smile remains in our hearts. The completion of the grotto was a massive step toward Rosemary's personal healing. The first two years after Joan's death were incredibly difficult for her. She had two surviving children to raise, and after years of struggling with mysterious symptoms, she was finally diagnosed after Joan's death with a rare neuromuscular autoimmune disorder called myasthenia gravis that made it extremely difficult for her to function normally. The disease still has no cure and can cause severe fatigue, weakness, and neurological symptoms. Rosemary said of her affliction, I had to develop my own strength through focus and determination. Time for another brief word from my sponsors. Starting the month after his arrest, Joseph McGowan became pen pals with a stranger named Sue Polin, who at the time lived in Bergenfield, New Jersey. Sue, a married mother of two boys, wrote back and forth with Joe for the next 33 years. 
she developed such a close relationship with him that she and her then-husband, Martin, became friendly with McGowan's mother, and Sue even visited McGowan in prison. McGowan rarely mentioned his crime in his letters to Sue, as if Joan never existed. He didn't outright deny committing Joan's murder, although he never admitted to sexually assaulting her, only vaguely alluding to the murder. He seemed intent on distancing himself from the crime by ignoring it completely. Mostly, McGowan wrote about the books he read, the conditions in prison, his interests, his court dates, advice about Sue's problems, and other mundane topics. He wrote a lot about his goal to get into a nicer prison facility and his post-parole plans, as if parole was inevitable. These letters would later form the basis for Rosemary's book, The Message of Light Amid Letters of Darkness. In December of 1973, Joseph McGowan pleaded guilty to murder, the charge for which did not include his sexual assault on Joan. He had the nerve to meet Rosemary's eyes at that court hearing. She stared him down, and he looked away. On January 25, 1974, Superior Court Judge Fred Galda refused to sentence McGowan on his indicted charge because the indictment did not specify that a sex crime had occurred. Before returning the case to the prosecution, Judge Galda said, Every report this court has examined suggests this case should be classified as a sex-oriented sodomy murder. It ought to be said and not held in a vacuum. Defense attorney Donald Conway was unhappy about the decision, calling the judge's comments unwise and unwarranted. We entered a plea of guilty in good faith. We are very much surprised and shocked. It was a very unusual decision for a judge, but it was fortunate. Had he chosen to sentence McGowan based on his guilty plea, the maximum sentence would have been a mere 14 years in prison, and he would have been eligible for parole in five without ever receiving psychiatric treatment. Because of this, before he could be sentenced, McGowan had to undergo a physical and mental evaluation at the Menlo Park Diagnostic Center, which was a requirement under the law at the time for sex offenses. One statement in the subsequent report read about Joan's murder, It was a one-time event. That was a very different opinion than that of retired FBI criminal profiler John Douglas, who interviewed Joseph McGowan in 1998. When he later wrote about the interview in his 2018 book, The Killer Across the Table, Douglas described McGowan as a ticking time bomb ready to go off if things didn't go his way. During his initial assessment in 1973, McGowan said that when Joan came to deliver his cookies, he was embarrassed and angry that he didn't have the correct change to pay for them. When he sexually assaulted Joan, he said, he couldn't complete the act, became even more embarrassed and angry, and decided he had to destroy the little girl. However, his story changed over the years. When he spoke to John Douglas in 1998, McGowan plainly said, When I heard the knock and looked up through the screen door and saw who was there, I knew I was going to kill her. There was definitely something odd about McGowan. A fellow Tappan Zee High School chemistry teacher, Jack Machino, said of McGowan's crime, It was really a shock that he did something like this. On the other hand, Joe was a strange fellow. He really was. And in retrospect, you think of things. Another thing that struck me was Joe's humor. There was a big gap in it. Things that he laughed at and thought were funny, the general population wouldn't laugh or go along with. Very bizarre. Joe always walked around with a set of keys. More keys than anyone would have need of. God only knows what they were for. One of the things Joe took it upon himself to do was to check classroom doors after the school day ended. And it was known that he actually turned in some of his colleagues for leaving their classroom doors unlocked. This was not in his line of duties. The only people he tried to ingratiate himself with were the administrators. Robert Carrillo, a math teacher who carpooled with McGowan every day, said, He was kind of seen as an administration toady. These kinds of things were important to him, seeking out approval or recognition from others. When asked if McGowan was popular with the students, Mr. Carrillo said, I think he was. He was the type of teacher who tried to be friendly with them. He strove to be liked by the kids. Rosemarie found out over the years following Joan's death that many of McGowan's former students were afraid of him. Several had stories to tell her about his inappropriate, sometimes dangerous behavior. At the same time, none of his fellow teachers saw any red flags about McGowan. He got along well with them, ate lunch with them, and even carpooled to work with two other teachers. While researching for their book, 
John Douglas and Mark Olshaker also learned that several female students felt uncomfortable around McGowan. One student asked him what she should do with a glass flask she didn't need. He took it from her and, without explanation, threw it to the ground, causing the glass to shatter. Another student wrote many years later on social media, Back in the day, I believe senior year 1971, I had McGowan for chemistry. I was so creeped out by him that I went to the office and demanded to get out of his class. One thing seems clear. Joseph McGowan knew how to put on a kind, caring, polite facade for the right people, but deep down, he was truly an unhinged creep. I'll delve deeper into McGowan's psychological assessments in the next episode. The month after his aborted sentencing hearing, McGowan was indicted on a charge of first-degree felony murder, which specified the crime was a murder while committing or attempting to commit a rape. In June of 1974, McGowan's trial was scheduled to begin. A jury was selected from Morris County rather than Bergen County to avoid jury bias due to the large amount of pretrial publicity the case received. Instead of facing a jury of his peers, however, McGowan decided to plead guilty to Jones' sexual assault and murder. When his attorney, Mr. Conway, announced the decision, he made sure to specify that his client was not pleading guilty to the crime of rape itself. He admits that he murdered her, but he maintains that he did not rape her. When accepting the guilty plea, Superior Court Judge Morris Malik asked McGowan to describe the crime. McGowan, clasping his hands in front of him and wearing a dark-colored plaid suit, said in a steady, emotionless voice, I did murder the victim and transport the body to New York State. She came to the door and downstairs into my room, where I committed the murder. He did not mention sexual assault. His mother, Genevieve McGowan, sat in the second row, dabbing at her eyes. On September 27, 1974, the day McGowan was scheduled to be sentenced, Mr. Conway tried to change his plea from guilty to not guilty by reason of insanity, saying that diagnostic tests showed McGowan was out of touch with reality when he murdered Joan. The judge struck this request down, citing the fact that three diagnostic tests had found McGowan legally sane and competent to stand trial. The sentencing hearing was once again postponed. When McGowan's mother, Genevieve, left the courtroom the day his attorney read aloud his psychological report, she told the media about her son, He is the best kid in the world. Around that time, McGowan wrote to his pen pal, Sue, I was really thrilled, yuck, to hear that psychiatric information come out in court. Even though he understood that his attorney had to present the report in his bid to change his plea to not guilty by reason of insanity, McGowan also wrote that he was annoyed that the newspapers reported the same information. Do you hear the world's smallest violin playing? Joseph K. McGowan was finally sentenced on November 4, 1974, for the crime of first-degree felony murder. Donald Conway put up a 45-minute argument that his client should be sentenced for second-degree instead of first-degree murder, which Judge Malik rejected. The judge told the convicted killer that because the death penalty was banned in New Jersey in 1972, the only thing he could do to McGowan was take his freedom by sentencing him to life in prison. State law at the time dictated that he would be eligible for parole in a startlingly short 14 years, which was the maximum allowed by law at the time. With credit for the 526 days he spent in the Bergen County Jail, this put McGowan's first parole eligibility date at April 7, 1987. On her way out of the courtroom, McGowan's mother snapped at the media, You will sleep well tonight. I would imagine that despite the vitriol behind her statement, she wasn't wrong. I'm betting a lot of people in the area slept better that night once Joan finally had some semblance of justice. Speaking of Genevieve, a friend related to Rosemarie that Mrs. McGowan had told a fellow churchgoer that she hated Rosemarie, whom McGowan only referenced in his letters as R.D., Ridiculously, Genevieve felt that if it hadn't been for Rosemarie, her precious son wouldn't have killed Joan and wouldn't be in prison. Make it make sense. About a week after his sentencing, Joseph McGowan was transferred to Trenton State Prison. From there, he wrote to his pen pal, Sue, Compared to this place, Bergen County Jail was a palace. Soon after his transfer, he was placed into protective custody, most likely due to the way the other inmates treated him. The PC unit was located in the Vroom building, 
which was six miles from the main prison facility in Trenton. Based on his writings, McGowan clearly continued to repress, ignore, and minimize the fact that he was in prison as punishment for the murder and sexual assault of seven-year-old Joan Angela D'Alessandro, whose name he never once wrote in his letters. He even called it laughable how long he had to wait before he would be eligible for parole. Joseph McGowan and his attorney filed an appeal in March of 1975. His request for a new trial was rejected in December of that year. Every one of his appeals was ultimately denied, even a last-ditch effort to ask for clemency from the New Jersey governor. In 1980, against his wishes, McGowan was transferred to the New Jersey State Prison Facility in Rahway, where he was placed into the general population. His letters around this time indicate that he was afraid of being attacked by the other inmates. He asked his pen pal, Sue, not to visit because he was afraid to go into the visiting yard, saying, My crime does not make me a popular person with certain members of the prison population. Ah. He successfully petitioned to move to the state prison in Leesburg, which is where he wanted to be all along because he considered it New Jersey's most comfortable prison facility. For some of his time in prison, McGowan, who earned a master's degree before his horrendous crime, sometimes taught classes to other inmates for a small amount of pay. As scheduled, McGowan first became eligible for parole in 1987, at which time it was denied for a 12-year period. However, it wouldn't be that long before his next parole date came up. When Rosemarie received a phone call from the Bergen County Prosecutor's Office in 1993, letting her know that McGowan was up for parole again already, she was shocked because she didn't know the 12-year eligibility period could be cut in half for good behavior and work credits. Joan had been gone for 20 years by that time, and Rosemarie felt it was time to remind the public about her special little girl. She said, It wasn't about dwelling on the grief, but being a squeaky wheel to fight to keep her killer in prison and trying to make sure he wouldn't be up for parole every few years. I thought starting a movement of the people would help us all. Rosemarie made it her mission to keep her daughter's killer behind bars and to create laws that would prevent other families from going through what hers had. She told the record in 1993 of Joan's murder, It was after this case that people became aware of what could happen in a quiet neighborhood. Indeed, an unnamed Hillsdale resident told the media after Joan's murder, Where before our streets were ringing with the sounds of play and laughter of children, now all we see are empty streets. Parents are deathly afraid to even let their kids play on the front lawn because they're scared they will be abducted in the way Joan was abducted. On September 30th, 1993, a vigil was held in Joan's honor at Veterans Park in Hillsdale, attended by over 1,500 people. Rosemarie realized it was her choice to take meaning from the timing of Joan's death. The message of hope was clear. It would be the movement for child protection and helping society inspired by Joan, Holy Thursday, and Good Friday. I realized then that this is the work I'm supposed to do, and I saw it as getting closer to Joan's spirit. That's when the movement started. I didn't get positive support from my family. Instead, quite the opposite when family members verbally assaulted me, actually threatened me with physical force, and sent harassing mail. McGowan was denied parole again, and in 1994, his future parole eligibility date was postponed for 20 years. Because of this development, he was sent back to Trenton State Prison, where he complained to his pen pal that the conditions were a thousand times worse than they were in Leesburg. He cautioned her again not to visit him there. In 1995, McGowan's lawyer began the process of appealing what was considered an extremely long future eligibility term. The parole board didn't just deny the appeal. They flat out refused to hear it. An appellate court took on McGowan's appeal, which would not conclude until 2002. In the meantime, the parole board was forced to revisit its 20-year future eligibility ruling and give McGowan a new hearing. Meanwhile, Rosemarie's mission had become a movement, organizing events, speaking publicly, and leading a campaign to inform the public of the dangers of child predators being released from prison. Her efforts paid off when in April of 1997, the New Jersey legislature passed Jones Law, which ensured that anyone convicted of murdering and sexually assaulting a child under the age of 14 would never be eligible for parole or otherwise walk out of prison with their freedom. 
the law was signed by then-Governor Christy Todd Whitman while Rosemarie and her family stood nearby. A federal version of the law was passed in 1998 and signed by President Bill Clinton. New York State would pass its version of Jones' law in 2004. In 2017, the New Jersey state law would be amended to include all child victims under 18. Unfortunately, the law did not apply retroactively to Jones' case. Still, Rosemarie was proud of her efforts to prevent other families from having to endure the horror of endless parole hearings. She said, At least they have that peace. In 1998, Joseph McGowan's interview with John Douglas provided priceless information that Douglas shared with the parole board, which went a long way toward McGowan's parole denial on November 6, 1998. In its statement explaining the denial, the board cited several factors, including the brutality of the crime, McGowan's extremely disconcerting lack of insight over what caused him to kill Joan, his lack of progress in addressing the issues that caused the murder, and the board's opinion that McGowan's mental and emotional health was not far different than it has been in the past, and it remains substantially likely he would commit a crime if released on parole. This time, the parole board ruled he would not be eligible for parole again for 30 years, although his good behavior and work credits meant his eligibility date would actually be 2009. This was the first time a 30-year future eligibility term was handed down in the state of New Jersey. Of course, he would appeal that as well. Also in 1998, Rosemarie formed the nonprofit Joan Angela D'Alessandro Foundation, also known as Joan's Joy, a foundation funding recreational and educational programs for less fortunate children, championing victims' rights, and supporting child safety programs. Her younger sons, Michael and John, became deeply involved with their mother's mission. The foundation is still active today, holding several events, programs, and fundraisers every year. In 1999, Channel 9's iTeam featured Joseph McGowan's quest for parole in a news segment, in which he describes what he was thinking on April 19, 1973, when Joan knocked on his door. The doorbell rings. I open it up. And the first thought is, can you kill that? And I just simply surrendered to that built-up anger that has been sitting there for years and growing for years and said, the controls. Andrew Consovoy, the chairman at the time of the parole board, said, I would fear for society if he ever got out. I really would. I mean, I, I would hide. He's basically the same person. And that's why we don't want to release him. Later that year, McGowan was transferred again back to East Jersey State Prison in Rahway which he described to his pen pal, Sue, saying, This place was a slime pit in 1980, and it's an even bigger one now. The following year, he was sent right back to Trenton. In 2000, another law Rosemary proposed and advocated for was passed in New Jersey, the Justice for Victims Law, eliminating the two-year statute of limitations for all wrongful death actions in murder, manslaughter, and aggravated manslaughter cases. This gives victims' families the right to sue the convicted killers if they obtain an inheritance or any other assets at any point after their crime. Importantly, this includes any wages they earn by working jobs in prison, which allowed Jones' family to file a lawsuit in 2001 to take any funds McGowan had. It didn't amount to much, but at least Rosemarie had the satisfaction of taking about $14 per month from McGowan's prison salary and transferring it directly to the Jones Joy Foundation to help at-risk children and youth. In 2002, the appeals court finally ruled on McGowan's appeal, upholding his 30-year parole eligibility term. They wouldn't have to deal with another parole hearing until 2008, at which time McGowan was denied parole again after the citizens of Hillsdale and its surrounding communities banded together with Rosemarie to fight his release. It was ordered that he must wait another 30 years before applying for parole again. He did not appeal the board's decision, and it was his last ever parole hearing. Rosemarie told the Star-Ledger at the time, It's an amazing decision. I really see this as something to be thankful for. Something else that helped the parole board to make this decision was the fact that Rosemarie gave them all 332 letters she received from Sue Poland's son, written to his mother by Joseph McGowan himself. His own lack of remorse and accountability helped seal his fate. Now for one last sponsor break.
In 2014, 40 years after Joan's death, Rosemarie unveiled the Joan Angela D'Alessandro White Butterfly Sculpture and Garden near the Hillsdale train station, where a green bench, Joan's favorite color, bearing Joan's signature, overlooks a permanent granite butterfly sculpture and a beautiful flower garden. Over the years, a white butterfly has become the symbol of Joan's free spirit, and whenever Rosemarie sees one, she knows her daughter is nearby. In 2018, the borough of Hillsdale approved the installation of a memorial fountain on behalf of the Joan Angela D'Alessandro Foundation for the White Butterfly Garden. The Child Safety Forever Fountain was activated on April 19, 2018, which was the 45th anniversary of Joan's death. According to Rosemary, the ever-flowing water represents the importance of ongoing child safety and of protecting the beauty and innocence of children. The D'Alessandro family soldiered on after Joan's death. Despite Rosemary's diagnosis of myasthenia gravis, after suffering a miscarriage, Rosemary and Frank welcomed another son, Michael, in 1980. Two years later, they had a third son, John. By the time Michael and John came along, Frankie and Marie were in their teens. Rosemary nearly divorced Frank in 1993 after witnessing him touching one of the younger boys inappropriately. Adding to the problems in the marriage were Frank's frequent episodes of rage and one incident of domestic violence. Frank ended up moving downstairs to the first level of the family home, and Rosemary insisted he keep his distance from the rest of the family. At the same time, she had just learned about McGowan's latest parole bid. My divorce plans had to change according to the advice that I sought from an attorney. The focus had to be on the fight to keep McGowan in, and that couldn't be complicated by the divorce. That parole fight continued until after her husband, Frank Dominic D'Alessandro, passed away on August 24, 2018, at the age of 82. He was survived by Rosemary, his four children, Frank, Marie, Michael, and John, and five grandchildren. Rosemary said, In my faith, God was always my psychiatrist. After what happened to Joan, I asked him to help me choose a life without animosity, and instead, a life advocating for prevention protection, and justice. Rosemary still lives in the same Hillsdale home she did in 1973, where she proudly displays many photos and mementos of her beautiful, beloved Joan. She can see the former McGowan home from her living room window, but she focuses more on her memories of Joan, her little bronzed ballet slippers, her drawings of butterflies, and other cherished items that prove Joan lived there and was very much loved there. Rosemary has had a lot to say about Joan in the time since her death. I was fortunate to know her. I was fortunate to have her for seven and a half years. She would stand up for something that she thought wasn't right. She loved flowers. She loved nature. She loved the color green. She had a magnetic personality. There was something different about her. She had a spirit that was so magnificent, um, so, so natural, so sincere, just a love of life. Rosemary said, Joan could have been just put in the cemetery and just left there, and you just go visit her and that's it. But I, I didn't want to leave Joan there. I wanted Joan to be remembered, to be known. Now, these families don't have to ever think about when the inmate is going to come up, up again for parole. They never have to go into testifying. They never have to live through that. At least they have that peace. Why has the whole movement started? Because of this little girl. Because of her life. She lived for seven and a half years. And guess what? She is helping to change the world. John Douglas and Mark Olshaker were the authors of Mindhunter, a popular book that spawned a Netflix series of the same name. In 2019, the same authors published a book called A Killer Across the Table, in which they profiled four murderers, one of whom was Joseph McGowan. The authors told Rosemarie how it's done plus why it's done equals who did it. The chapter about Joan's case was based on Mr. Douglas's interview with McGowan, as well as his conversations with Rosemarie, who had input into the chapter. 
the authors were deeply impacted by Joan's story and her mother's relentless activism, and the book was dedicated to Joan's memory in honor of Rose Marie with love and admiration. Mr. Olshaker told the journal News in 2019 that some cases affect authors deeply, especially when it comes to child victims, and particularly when the survivors have turned their unimaginable grief into activism, trying to do things for other people. McGowan would have been eligible for parole again in 2025. On June 5, 2021, 75-year-old Joseph McGowan died from unpublicized causes in the Southwoods State Prison in Cumberland County, New Jersey. Rosemary, who never again has to face her daughter's murderer during a parole hearing, told a reporter, The first thought that came into my mind is now we could concentrate on the 50th anniversary of Joan's impactful and loving legacy, which will be 50 years in 2023. We won't have to use the time and energy to fight to keep him in prison. I am thankful to all those who came together for the victories we had to make sure he would stay in prison and not harm any more innocent children or anyone else. He was not only a child killer, he was a serial killer in the making. The very same day that McGowan died, a Jones Joy supporter unearthed a large, heart-shaped rock about 12 feet away from where Jones' body was found on Easter Sunday in 1973. The fight to prevent Joseph McGowan from getting out of prison was over, and Joan's spirit of love and hope was alive and well. Joan continues to let her mom, siblings, and supporters know that her light will never dim and her impact will live on. I'm going to stop here for this episode. In part two, I'll dig into the multiple psychological evaluations of Joseph McGowan, which I feel are not only fascinating and terrifying, but also necessary to understand why he was not only able to assault and murder little Joan, but then minimize that fact for almost 50 years afterward, pretending to be just an average, normal person when he was, in fact, anything but. Also in part two, you'll hear my conversation with Joan's mom, Rosemarie D'Alessandro, who continues to lead Joan's joy in the Foundation's quest to remember Joan today so tomorrow's children will be safe. My sources for this episode were NorthJersey.com, NJ.com, The Star Ledger, The Journal News, The New York Times, The New York Post, The Daily News, The Record, The Pascack Press, The Bergen County Prosecutor's Office website, Find a Grave, Court Documents, Dignity Memorial, The Girl Scouts of America, Rosemary D'Alessandro's book titled The Message of Light Amid Letters of Darkness, John Douglas and Mark Olshaker's book titled The Killer Across the Table, Dr. Frederick Zugabee's book titled Dissecting Death, Secrets of a Medical Examiner, The Jones Joy website, and Rosemary D'Alessandro. As I mentioned at the top of the episode, just a quick update on what's been going on. I'm sorry for taking an unintended hiatus for about three months. If you follow me on social media, you've already heard that I've had some mental health struggles over the past few months. I've suffered from major depressive disorder and anxiety all my life, which I can usually manage with medication and other methods, but from time to time, I do experience breakthrough symptoms. This time, though, I was also dealing with severe burnout from working seven days a week for over three and a half years, during which I've immersed myself in the worst of humanity every single day. It caught up with me, and I'm still working to overcome it. I'm hoping I'll ultimately be able to release weekly episodes as I have been since 2020, but please be patient with me if I can't always meet the mark. I promise to do my best. Also, after unpublishing a few episodes at the end of last year at the request of the families, I am 100% committed to creating episodes going forward only with the permission and preferably the participation of the child surviving innocent family members. Before I sign off, I'd like to thank all the patrons who stuck with me at patreon.com slash stlcpod while I was on my unintended hiatus. I'd also like to thank everybody who's joined me since my last episode. Bridget B. from Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Aaron W. from Moline, Illinois. Mary H. from High Springs, Florida. Brooke V. from Rockville, Indiana. Beth D. from Gastonia, North Carolina. Andrea W. from St. Clair Shores, Michigan. Alexa S. from Shoreham, New York, Paige K. from Davenport, Iowa, Gina H. from Clover, South Carolina, Janine L. from San Antonio, Texas, and from The Mystery Spot, thank you to Alicia P., 
Nicholas F., Christine O., Anastasia A., Morty A., Lexi H., and Zolvig. Thank you all so much for your support. That's it for this episode. Join me next time for part two of Joan's story. If you like the show, please follow or subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Spreaker, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. And please leave me a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com. You can support the show by visiting patreon.com slash stlcpod, where you can become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to bonus content and exclusive gifts. You can also support the show at ko-fi.com slash stlcpod. Follow the podcast on Facebook and Instagram at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on TikTok at stlcpod. View photos related to today's episode on Facebook. This podcast is researched, written, hosted, edited, and produced by Lane. Intro theme music is by Dreamnote Music, and all music for the show is licensed from audiojungle.net. For more information about preventing or reporting child abuse, visit childhelp.org or call your area's child abuse hotline. And remember, if you see something, say something. <laughs>